I want to uh, maybe close with our most exciting new area in cancer therapy in general and, and hematologic malignancies, which is immunotherapies above and beyond monoclonal antibodies against CD38 and CS1 and SLAMF7. Uh, particularly, let's talk about, first of all, checkpoint inhibition. And Saad, what's happening at this meeting with respect to myeloma and checkpoint inhibitors? I think we, we're seeing some data with uh, pembrolizumab in combination with um, IMIDS. Um, the one abstract that I'm particularly struck by with uh, is, is Ashraf Badros, so his experience with pomalidomide and dexamethasone in a fairly advanced patient population um, that is refractory, um, showing responses above and beyond what we would expect with POMDEX, so about 60 or percent. It's doubling, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. so, so that is quite remarkable. Um, you so know, let, me, let me push back on that a little bit. Are you, are you convinced that that's um, better than we would get with POMDEX alone, Paul? I think so, and I, I think that the whole construct of immuno-oncology and myeloma is, is, obviously we've been doing it for years, perhaps unbeknownst with the IMIDs, um, but at the same time, uh, to see this kind sort of synergy is, is incredibly encouraging. Mm -hmm. So Keith, I think to really answer your question, mm -hmm. because the response rate mm -hmm. is always how we t traditionally mm -hmm. measure these, these things, but one of the benefits of PD-1 inhibition yes. may not be response rate, but durability, durability. of response. Exactly. I and agree. what we see from Asharoff's data is that the PFS actually looks almost as good, if not perhaps better, than Palmdera in terms of PFS. Yes, I agree. I and think so the that, PFS I think, is the real interesting goes on to 14 months, yes. which you, you know, um, historically you would expect a PFS of maybe four or five months at best. Right. So, so that was extremely striking. So it's I didn't fully appreciate that, so that's yeah. good, yes, good to hear because I was a bit nervous. That yeah, and, and I think it's a single study, so it's always hard yes, to, yeah. to make Patient huge selection. conclusions, mm -hmm. yeah. but, but it wasn't the response rate that really drew my attention yeah. to that abstract, it was the PFS yes. that really yes. struck no, me. Yes, I agree. Were there other studies of uh, checkpoint inhibitors here with lenalidomide or other drugs, uh, Amrita? Um, I think there's one about nivolumab and um, in high-risk smoldering disease that also, again, is, is uh, interesting in combination with lenalidomide. There and, are a lot of trials mm -hmm. of these drugs now undergoing uh, studies, but I think for now, is anybody using these off-label, or are they? Should I hide under the table and say yes? <laughs> <that we are? laughs> but yeah, I mean, I think, again, it, we've certainly been yeah. struck by the pembrolizumab data. I guess we, I haven't yet. I'm not totally convinced, but we'll, we'll see as time goes on. So yeah. well, certainly some updates on checkpoint inhibitors. What about cellular therapies? That's the, the really hot topic here. And, um, Sagar, tell us what's new. Well, I think, you know, what, what we are seeing is the data on BCMA as a target for CAR T cells. Um, and certainly the, the data that was presented last year from the NIH group was very provocative and I think very interesting. Uh, between um, uh, additional studies looking at BCMA that have been presented either here at the meeting or in press releases, it's looking increasingly like BCMA is probably the better target for a cellular-based therapy for myeloma. Uh, I think, in my view, there are still questions about the broad applicability of that approach, but certainly the proof of concept is quite clear. Thoughts? So, I mean, I agree with Saga in terms of data at this meeting with BCMA as a target. Data at another meeting also, I think, is striking. I think the two things in terms of, of uh, CAR T cell therapy, and someone said it last night, well, don't try this at home yet because we do need to appreciate for example, in the UPEN data, the, the toxicity, uh, at least three of those patients had severe cytokine release syndrome, which, you know, speaking from experience, is challenging to manage. And so I think that's one thing to note. The other thing is persistence of these modified T cells. So, you know, we still struggle with that. Is it loss of BCMA expression that causes relapse? we need to sort of still modify, we need to make a better generation of, of CAR T cells, and I think that's what we're also going to see in the future, safer and better constructs. Precision medicine has got a lot of attention, and we haven't talked much about that today. Um, there are clinical trials underway trying to match drugs to genomics. Is there anything at the meeting that struck you with respect to uh, genomics and precision therapies. Well, I mean, a, a, the Vinnie's Clack story itself sort of speaks volumes to a sort of targeted I therapy guess that in that is regard. the best example. And I think it, it is yeah. the best example. Um, but I, I think at the same time, it's kind of interesting because it's a great question, Keith. You're kind of seeing this sort of dichotomy. On the one hand, you're seeing 
the antibody and immunotherapy data, which just throws a big net around the disease and shuts it down regardless of what the mutational thrust may be. And on the other hand, there are these more targeted approaches. And again, I think there's space for both. Okay. Um, but I think the venetoclax story to me is the most powerful in reminding us that targeted approaches can really matter. I think the, you know, the challenge with the precision medicine piece really relates to the fact that because even in a single patient, the clone can be so heterogeneous, right. it's hard to know whether that precision approach will actually get you where you want to be. I agree. Well, this has been an extremely informative discussion. And before we end, I'd like to get final thoughts from each of our panelists, maybe a, a take home message, what's new at the meeting that, that you enjoyed, and uh, maybe a message for the community oncologists who might be watching. So we'll start with uh, Dr. Krishna, ladies first. I think, you know, what I enjoyed is, number one, obviously there's so many new drugs and old drugs reinventing themselves. I did mm. want to speak to that point in terms of nelfinavir, which I actually was struck by, and I admit I was skeptical when I mm. saw the early data um, that a drug this used for something this, completely different for HIV, HIV drug, mm. right? can mm. have responses in bortezomib refractory patients. So I, I think I'm struck by new combinations old agents used in new ways. And I think Venetoclax speaks to that as well. Sagar, your favorite take home from ASH 2016? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, and, and we've been involved with the Venetoclax story from the laboratory aspect for a long time. That really is quite a striking, striking story. And I think um, it sort of speaks against what many of us have said, which is combination therapy is the answer to get to MRD negativity and cure. If you can find a vulnerability like this, it may actually be more important than four drugs, three drugs, five drug combinations, if you can find the right cell. Excellent point. Uh, Paul? I just think that there are some really exciting new agents as well. I'm very impressed, frankly, by the Selenexor story, and I think it's a testimony to the investigators there sticking at it, managing the side effects, and kind of seeing a signal but not giving up. Because I think what's very important for everyone to share, and certainly my takeaway from ASH 2016 and myeloma, is that we need all these drugs. It, it truly isn't one versus the other. And I think as we think about DARA, for example, there's a sort of sense, you know, well, now you've got DARA, game over. No, no, absolutely not. You know, we've yeah. still got plenty of work to do. I would totally agree with that. And uh, Saad, what do you, no, what's your favorite moment here? I, I share everyone's sentiments, you know, even though we are, we are overwhelmed with, with, you know, these, these nice stories, specifically Selenexor and Venetoclax, perhaps probably the more, more exciting ones. You know, the, the other challenge that faces us moving forward is, you know, how do we uh, tease out which agents to use at what mm. periods of time and then what, what combinations. I think that's, that's, that's the bigger challenge uh, that we have ahead of us. And I think for me, the, the highlight is the CAR T cell story, particularly the BCMA CAR Ts, which we, we need to learn how to use, when to use, and how to manage. But those are uh, really incredible stories, even though somewhat anecdotal right now. So this has been a very enjoyable discussion, impressive data at the meeting. I'd like to uh, thank all of you for your contributions to this discussion. And on behalf of our panel, we thank you for joining us, and we hope you found this peer exchange discussion to be useful and informative.